Take my bride, let's go for a ride in my new fangled automobile. This where we will go. Nobody knows, but it's sure a great way to feel. Behind the wheel of the speed me to steal, it's my new fangled automobile. Hello and welcome to Vintage Car History. I'm Wild Bill. In 1872, Jules Verne published his book, Around the World in 80 Days. The hero, Phineas Fogg, managed to circumnavigate the globe in just enough time and win a large bet in the process. As a result of this book, quite a few people tried to accomplish the same feat that was in the fictional book and succeeded. Of course, cars weren't around in 1872, but it was only a matter of time before someone would try to drive a car around the world. And so, in 1908, the longest car race ever undertaken got underway. A race to drive around the world. Another inspiration for this race occurred in 1907, when five teams raced from Peking to Paris. The race was over 9,000 miles and took some two months to complete. It was quite a sensation in the papers, and a few publishers decided to get together and sponsor an even bigger race. The New York Times, Chicago Tribune, and the Le Matin in Paris came up with an absurd idea, a car race from New York to Paris. Now the obvious objection is, shouldn't this be a yacht race? There's a pond known as the Atlantic Ocean directly between these two places, and a car race to see who could find the fastest ship to ferry them across wasn't very exciting. Instead, the idea was to start at Madison Square Garden in New York and go west. Drive across North America and get to Alaska. Do it in winter so the cars can drive across what should be a frozen Bering Strait, keep on through Siberia, the rest of Russia, into Europe, and arrive at the Eiffel Tower to win. Sounds simple. This is 1908. No road existed that crossed the U.S., Canada, or Russia. Railroads did exist, but those are designed for locomotives, and trying to drive a car down railroad tracks for a few thousand miles won't end well for the car. If the oncoming train doesn't crush it, the rails and ties will tear the car apart in a fairly short order. Gas stations also did not exist at this time and there were huge swaths of open land with no civilization for hundreds of miles. How could a car possibly make such a journey? If this race was actually going to happen, it would take some work to figure out the logistics of it. So the publishers all sat down with a big globe and plotted a possible route, as well as the rules to govern the race. It was conceded that at some points and places, the cars would probably need to get on a ship. At the time, it was technically possible to cross the USA by car, but not Canada. Along the western side of Canada, there were no roads or railroads connecting the continental U.S. to Alaska. With thousands of miles and nothing but wilderness between them, it was decided that the cars would need to get from New York to San Francisco. From there, take a ship to Seattle, and from Seattle to Valdez, Alaska. Drive across Alaska, across the frozen strait, into Siberia. Follow the settlements along the Siberian road, Railroad across Russia and into Poland. Drive across Poland, through Germany, and into France to finally arrive at the Tower. A difficult route, yes, but theoretically possible. How to officiate it? It was decided to have each car carry a referee or timekeeper. Thus, each team would be composed of a car, a driver, a mechanic if needed, and a referee. The timekeeper was to be appointed by the various publishers and would be responsible for keeping things fair. For example, if one team arrived at the port and got on the ship three hours before the next car embarked, when the ship arrived at the destination, the car that arrived later would be required to wait three hours before continuing. So with the rules and route figured out, it was time to advertise the race and see who, if anyone, would actually participate. First thing was to decide on a prize for the winner. Le Martin offered a $1,000 cash prize and a trophy. A massive globe weighing nearly a ton would go to the team that accomplishes the feat first, presented to the team and the company that built the car. The trophy was massive, valuable, and represented a unique accomplishment that would certainly make people want to buy the cars of the winning team. Next, decide on when the race would start, and the choice was February 12, 1908, at 11 a.m. 
Six intrepid teams showed up at the Madison Square Garden that morning, each eager for both the trophy and the thrill of the adventure ahead. Three French teams, one American, one German, and one Italian. Each team represented a specific car maker, who in turn built the cars and modified them for the race. The route was plotted and the publishers established checkpoints to be manned along the way. All that was needed was for someone to shoot the starting pistol and things would get underway. Here's who the entrants were. From France, the three cars were a Dédion Bouton, a Motoblock, and a Cesare Nardin. The USA had a Thomas Flyer, Germans a Protost, and Italy a Zeust. The Dédion was a four-cylinder, 30-horsepower beast with the teams of uh, Fons Hansen, Bossier de saint chaffre and Alphonse Altran. The Motoblock was also a 30-horsepower inline four-banger driven by Charles Godard, Arthur Hugh, and Maurice Livier. The last and actually least of the French teams was César Nodin, with a 15-horsepower car that was the smallest of any of the cars present. Now, the German Protos was a 30-horsepower machine that was very overbuilt and well-stocked for the trip. The team consisted of Hans Köppen, Hans Naep, and Ernest Most. The Italian Zust was a big car with a 40-horsepower inline four, and, along with Pirelli tires, it sported a team of Guilia Sitori, Antonio Scarfoglio, and Henry Haga. The U.S. showed up with the biggest car, a 60-horsepower four-cylinder Thomas Flyer car. The car only had room for two persons, and the team was George Schuster and Montague Roberts. Of course, with no gas stations around, these cars would all need to have huge gas tanks since filling up opportunities along the route would be rare. The Cesar Nardin carried 80 gallons, the Motoblock and the Thomas Flyer had 100, Zeus 132, De Dion 183 gallons, and the Protos a whopping 204 gallons of gas. Basically, each car had as many gas tanks that they could bolt on, along with the needs of the team. Food, water, change of clothes, various toiletries, and of course, any tools and parts they might need along the way for the cars. All were lined up and ready to go at 11 a.m. All that was needed was for the mayor of New York City, George McClellan Jr., to fire the pistol and get things rolling. Yes, that George McClellan, the son of the Union Army General. And over a quarter of a million people were also in attendance to see the start of the greatest race of all time. However, it would seem that the mayor forgot to show up at 11 a.m., and by a quarter after, he was nowhere to be seen. So Colgate Hoyt, who was nearby at the table where the starting gun was sitting, grabbed the thing and fired it into the air, and the race was on! Well, the least of the cars, the Cesare Naudin, was also lasted the least. After a mere 96 miles, the rear axle broke in half, and they were done. But the other five continued on for days, weeks, and months. For the first few days, it was a battle with the elements, since what paths were available were covered in over a foot of snow. The cars would bog down in the snow and mud, and would often seek out local farmers to help pull them out with their horses. The situation early in the race caused some tension and downright animosity amongst the teams. The Thomas Flyer was an American car with an American team, and while driving through the USA, the locals would gladly lend their own countrymen a hand, hoping to help secure a win for the USA. The teams from the other countries were not so well treated while crossing the states. If the locals would help them at all, it was for a fee. Many of the other teams complained about this, asking the publishers to discourage the public from influencing the race in such an unsportsmanlike manner. The Tribune did do this, but the local favoritism was the least of the problems facing these cars while crossing the USA. The sheer variety of roadless terrain was nightmarish. Mountains, swamps, rivers, most with no road of any kind. As the five remaining teams left New York State and continued west to San Francisco, they traveled along the Great Lakes in winter, which in February are covered in snow and ice. And once the cars reached Iowa, fuel became incredibly sparse as well. Most small towns and villages along the way didn't have enough gas on hand to fill up even one of these cars, much less all of them. The French Motoblock team was having some chronic mechanical problems up to this time and the team decided to just load the car onto a freight train and haul it into San Francisco. And were it not for the fact that a photographer snapped a picture of them loading the car onto the train, they might have got away with it. However, the cheating got to the press, and the team simply sold the car to whoever wanted to buy it and went home. So now we're down to four teams remaining. Now, the German's Protos team was nearly lost when crossing Wyoming. 
The car couldn't handle the swampy ground, so they chose to use the railroad, having brought with them a set of metal tires just for that purpose. Well, no one told the train coming at them to expect a car in their way, and the protos had to jump the track immediately or be destroyed. Jumping the track in an emergency fashion didn't go so well, and the car crashed into a ditch. Thankfully, no one was seriously injured except the car, which took several days to repair and get back moving. But they had lost precious time, and so they, too, decided to take a train from there directly to Seattle. Though they did break the rules, the judges decided not to disqualify them, but instead institute a two-week penalty to their final score. The Thomas Flyer was well ahead of everyone when the team arrived in San Francisco. They quickly boarded their ship to Seattle and then on to Valdez, Alaska. The Flyer team was way ahead, arriving in Valdez on April 8th before the next team even made it to Seattle. However, they were actually quite a bit behind expectations. The race officials expected the crossing of the USA to take about two weeks, but it took over three times that long. The American team scouted ahead to see what conditions they would run into and found a problem. It was too late in the year and driving across the strait was no longer possible. And after a series of frantic telegrams, a decision was made the race would be rerouted. From Seattle, the teams would now sail to Yokohama, Japan, drive across that country, and then board another ship to Vladivostok. The other teams got the word before they left Seattle, but the U.S. team had to board a ship back to Seattle and then continue from there. By the time they were on the new course, they had lost two weeks of time in the debacle. Thankfully for them, the officials decided to credit this time to their result. It was in Japan that the next team dropped out of the race. The French De Dion team could not navigate the Japanese terrain of the time, and so they, like Motoblock before them, sold their car to the highest local bidder and quit the race. Meanwhile, the remaining cars, the German, Italian, and American teams, began the trek across Asia. The problems ahead for the remaining teams were numerous. A complete lack of places to get gasoline, the muddy bogs of springtime Siberia, and the lack of any roads made the trek grueling. All three were making slow but steady progress, while the Germans now in the lead. Indeed, at 6.15 p.m. on Sunday, July 16th, 1908, and after 21,933 miles, the Protos, being driven by Köppen, arrived at the finish line. He was met by a small and cordial crowd and treated to a buffet of cold cuts and crackers. Though he arrived first, he was also under a two-week penalty for his train trip across Wyoming, so he was not necessarily the winner. The winner would cross the line a few days later, although not without incident. On July 30th, at about 9 p.m., the American crew on board the Thomas Flyer sped through the streets of Paris towards the tower and got pulled over by a cop. No, seriously, they were stopped by a French police officer, who informed them that they were under arrest for driving a car in Paris without any headlights. Now, there was a cafe nearby where a number of race fans were waiting and rushed to try to explain to the officer what was going on, but the policeman held his ground and insisted on arresting the team and confiscating the car. But a passerby on his bicycle saw this happen, and since his bike had a headlight, he simply deposited the bike onto the car next to the driver. Now, the car had a headlight, and the officer let them pass. With the penalty that the Germans were handed and the credit that the Americans were given, the flyer actually beat the Protos by 26 days. This remains to this day the largest gap between first and second place ever in a car race. The distance of nearly 22,000 miles makes this the longest car race ever undertaken, and the total time of 169 days to complete the race also makes it the longest amount of time ever needed to complete a race. To put it simply, this race was, and still is, the greatest car race ever in world history. Thanks for watching Vintage Car History, and we'll see you next week. Peace.